happen? Like, was it written in text or like like the pictures that we see the iconography of these female deities? Like, how did they come about? Because I've always seen different interpretations throughout India, throughout time. So, like, how is there any like original text? Like, this is what she looks like. I just wondering like how it came about. That's a great question. Um, and Rama, you might have something to say about that as well. Pardon? The sculptures found in the Indian temples? Right. I mean, the Hindu imagery, the iconography is its so ancient. Um, and these images have been around for such a long time. There are texts that describe them. There are specific texts um, that talk about how they are meant to be depicted. In, more in terms of um, how to actually go about drawing them. So they're basically artist books that give you kind of frame by frame of, you start with the base um, figure, and then you add, you know, in this order, you add the various emblems and whatnot. Um, and I think in a lot of their, the texts in which they appear, like the Devi Mahatmya, um, and in other texts, they will give you a very specific, you know, they'll, they describe in words what the goddesses look like. So I think it develops out from that, as well as from sculpture, um, which is... Which is drawn inspiration from the text. Right, I mean, they, they, you know, they go hand in hand, right? Um, but it is also interesting that the images do change to a certain degree over time. Um, and again, particularly with popular media um, today, it's killing me that I don't have my images with me, um, but the, what, what people are doing with these images, particularly of um, Kali and Durga, you know, kind of the fun that people in various circumstances can have with them is, is, is really fascinating. Um, and it's also interesting to see how and when people come up with the different ideas about them. I'm thinking about this goddess Hustani. This is actually the goddess that, that I have spent a lot of time working on. Um, and in her text, um, which again dates back to the 16th century, she's described in a bit particular way. Um, she has, she's seated on a lion, she has, you know, a golden complexion, she has the various emblems and so on and so forth. But over time and in, in recent history, within the last, I would say, 50 years, there is an artist in a small town um, on, on, on the outskirts of the Cavendu Valley who has created a whole new image of her. It's not entirely different, but he felt compelled to paint an image of her, and he started mass producing it and selling it at the festival surrounding this particular goddess. So that particular image has become increasingly associated with her and, and that community. So there are kind of adjustments that can take place over time, but there's also a very kind of ancient tradition that, that sets, you know, that sets, a, that sets a, the record. Yeah, please. That there are also like these Adama Shastras or these texts that say not only what the image should look like, but there are certain practices that the sculptor or the artist has to undergo when making the images. Like for example, even for the Rebuja, the very strict practices that have to be observed when the image is created in order to make it safe and powerful. Yeah, so I guess
that are considered to be kind of normative texts, be it the Vedas, the Puranas, so on and so forth. A lot of them have large dates attached to them. Like I said, um, the Devi Bhagavata Purana, 6th century to I think the 14th century, it was written sometime within that time period and, and over that time period, because again, a lot of these texts are being added onto and amended and transformed. So, um, you know, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, um, Mahabharata 500 BCE to 500 CE, the Ramayana 400 BCE to 400 CE. So they, they span a very large chunk of time, right? But there is a sense of, we're pretty certain that they were composed during those time periods. Um, so I think a lot of that research has already, you know, been done and been kind of confirmed as the way that it is. In terms of some of these other texts that are newer, um, in terms of dating them, a lot of texts offer the date in them, just as many, if not more, don't. Um, in which case, it's, you know, trying to put together the pieces of the puzzle and figuring out, you know, by the content of, of a text, what it's referring to, um, if there's any kind of autobiographical information involved in the text um, that help you date it um, and place it in a, in a given time period. So it's actually, if anyone likes doing archival work, which might sound kind of dry, it's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. I personally enjoy it myself. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure yeah. that. Um, and also, like, you know, you said these were composed at around a certain time. Also because previously before these um, stories are used to be told by and passed on through the oral tradition, how do you kind of differentiate between like when like they could have actually been available and known by people before through the oral tradition before they were written down in the script? So that's kind of like my question. Like how do you know that they weren't around before through the oral tradition? And how do you know yeah. Are you asking how do you know when it actually happened? No, no, no. Or it didn't happen. Because she was talking about the evolution right. of how the images change. Right. So how, how do you know kind of which order they go in? Oh. It? Because it doesn't, like, the oral tradition kind of, you know, things make things messier. Right, right. I mean, certainly because, um, because South Asia is by and large historically been an, illiter an, an illiterate culture, the oral tradition has been huge. I mean, that has preceded the written tradition um, by a very long time. Um, and we do know that for a lot of these different goddesses um, and gods, that there were oral traditions that preceded the written text that we have. How far back they date, it's really hard to say. Um, you know, it's, again, we think that there is an oral tradition for a lot of them, a lot there is there are still oral traditions today um, that are very important. Sometimes traditions seem to pop up without necessarily having oral traditions. That's more a slightly more modern thing. Again, like Santoshi Ma um, seems to have come out of the blue in 1962 through these small pamphlets. Um, which any of you, you know, in India, you've seen the bazaars, just the the Vrakatha pamphlets. Um, the goddess Sustani, the oldest text that we have is, again, to the late 16th century, and we have no documentation of her tradition before that. We presume that there was an oral tradition that preceded it, but we have no, no one references it anywhere. Um, so again, it's kind of putting together the pieces of the puzzle. But in terms of the relationship between the oral tradition and the written tradition, there definitely is an important relationship there, and it's um, a lot of what is in an oral tradition then eventually gets put into writing. Um, but then also, it's not to say that there's still not a lot of fluidity and flexibility in both the oral tradition and in the written tradition. Um, although some might say that the oral tradition is actually less fluid because it is so, memorization is so key in passing down the oral tradition um, that there's less kind of variability and, and room to maneuver there Whereas in the written tradition, I think things, once they're in writing, they have an ability to be manipulated a little bit more. Was there another question? Yeah. Um, in Hinduism in, in general, there's um, many of the gods and goddesses have an animal in the picture with them. Like, do you know why that is? The animal represents their vehicle. 
all DDs have a vehicle that they use as their transport. Um, and, you know, so Shiva has uh, the bull, um, Ganesh has the mouse, um, and so on and so forth. It's, it's considered their vehicle. Yes? Uh, going along with the vehicles, um, do those have any, like, symbolic uh, significance? Like, with Ganesh and the mouse, um, at least what I've heard, They do reflect on the, the different deities. Um, Ganesh, you know, rides uh, the mouse. It's part of his mythology of riding around. He's in competition with his brother Kumar, um, and they are challenged by their parents to circumambulate. Um, the world. The world. Right. Thank you. The world. Um, and they. Uh, so Kumar sets off on his peacock, and is able to go very quickly. Kamada uh, decides to go on his, circumambulates his parents because they are considered his world. Um, and so there's there's something there about how, you know, I mean, a mouse, how is he, he's so concerned that, how is he gonna beat his brother on a peacock when his vehicle is a mouse? And then he realizes that his world are his parents, is his parents. Um, and so, you know, they, they figure in, in that sense, um, the, the bull with Shiva, I mean, they, they also are their companions. Um, and certainly, you know, when you have like a bull as a vehicle, it, it lends a certain amount of, you know, I'm starting to lack for words here tonight, um, kind of oomph to the mythology. Did you want to add something? No, he, uh, Shiva lives in the Shmasana. Shmasana is the graveyard. So the vehicles were very relatable to what was his task, what was his job, what was his role in the And uh, Vishnu ro rode on a guru, a bird. And then, um, you know, like she was saying, Ganesha, I mean, he proved that Kirti is more important. Kirti means um, intelligence and um, proper rightful thinking was more important than actually per se go around the three or go around the three worlds or world three times because he saw his parents were the ruler of the world, ruler of the world and he thought okay that that kind of said it and did it so the vehicles were uh, I mean particularly for the peacock maybe Aparna can speak we just did a piece on that why did uh, Muruga or Kumara get the peacock uh, so or, I mean the Seval Kodi yeah you can uh, talk about. well was, um, there was um, a demon that he was supposed to kill, that he was very, very elusive, that no one could kill, so then he was given the task, and he accomplished it, and when he killed the demon, the demon asked for um, mercy and for forgiveness. Yeah, and then he splits in half. So then one half was taken as a, um, a flag, the other one turned into a peacock. So every, for every deity, they received, they got their vehicles because of a certain story, or a certain connection. So it was not it was not just like okay you take this and I'll take that. Not that kind of well, I, I almost feel like sure the mythology is fine, like yeah. how do they get it? But more like does it give like a symbolic meaning to the character that the character that the uh, god or goddess represents? So a bull has strength that Shiva Promotes, or has determination, or um, um, I guess stubbornness. Mm -hmm. But um, do do these vehicles provide not just like a physical way of moving around, mm -hmm. but rather a uh, symbolic uh, enhancement or uh, I guess manifestation of what they're. I, mean, I, I can't speak to like the specifics because it's so intricate, but the Vahanas are part of their iconography. So for example, even like Durga when she has all of her weapons, each of
magical weapons has a symbolic or allegorical meaning associated with it. I can't remember off the, off the top of my head what they are, but that's the whole idea when, when you're asked to meditate on a deity and the way you visualize them, it's not just the image, but the image brings certain lakshanas or qualities or with these types of energy with it. And each part, even their expressions, what they're holding in their hands, the mudras of their hands, the way their feet or legs are positioned, everything has a meaning and brings an energy or a pavana with it. And the vahana is definitely part of that. And there is a lot of text out there on what each of those things are, but I, I don't know. No, there is certainly a connection with the way you're talking about, but I'm not familiar with it off the top of my Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in the end of Ramayana, in the end of Ramayana, Shita um, gives herself into the earth. Through interpretation of text, is there always a debate with you? Did she quit on the world, or was it a self-sacrifice, or what did you think when you read the story or even studied it? Um, there, well, there are. We were talking about this um, before the program started. There are several different uh, Ramayanas, versions of the Ramayana out there. In some versions, the that part of the story is not even part of the story. Um, in some version, it ends with Udama and Sita happy as two peas in a pod, and they're ruling over their kingdom. Um, and without any of the subsequent drama that entails. Um, but obviously, in certain Ramayanas, it is a very critical part of, of the narrative. And I think one of the main interpretations of it is, you know, that Sita, this is the final ex expression of hers of her independence and of her saying enough is enough. You know, I've, I've, I've proven my chastity to you, I've proven my faithfulness to you, and I can't, I can't do any more. Um, and so I, I'm going to go back to where I came from, which is Mother Earth, right? She, um, she's born of the Earth, and so in returning to, returning to the Earth is kind of her way of making peace with everything. Um, and, and kind of taking herself out of the equation and saying, Rama, you have to do what you have to do. Um, again, we were talking about this. Well, Rama is, you know, Sita is considered to be this ideal Hindu wife. Um, and I think one of the frequent misinterpretations is that Rama is supposed to be the ideal Hindu husband. And he's not. I mean, he's a pretty crappy husband. Let's face it, right? You know, I mean, the things he demands of his wife um, and the way in which he distrusts her and so on and so forth, but he is the ideal king. And that's really the point of the Ramayana, is that he is sacrificing everything to fulfill his kingly dharma. Um, so there's a tension there between Sita and her dharma and Rama and his dharma and, and what's going on there. Yeah. Um, what's your take on the uh, Ramayana with like the whole Maya Sita, where um, I'm not really sure how it starts, but exactly what I was telling you, right? Where she's she's considered to be well, uh, well, so um, you tell me, and then I'll I don't want to put words in your mouth. Okay, um, like I don't know how it starts off in the beginning, but basically that the whole time she's with uh, Ravana, that's not the real Sita, that's like a Maya Sita, an illusion Sita, and so when. Rama asks her to walk through the fire at the end, um, like to prove her chastity or whatever. That's in, through that walking through the fire, the minus, the real Sita comes back. So, what's your view on that? I think it's great. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think I think that's one of the wonderful things about the Ramayana tradition is that there are so many versions of it, which speaks to the amount of interest that there is in the whole story and in coming to terms with it and in making it work for different communities and different times who have different perspectives on what it means, what that relationship means, and who those, really, who those individuals represent um, like as individuals and as part of a partnership um, as husband and wife. And so I think that there's, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna say that I think one version is better than the other. I personally as, you know, a, a 
feminist, modern woman. Yeah, I'm kind of partial to certain endings more so than others, maybe. But but that's that's not for me to to judge the text. I think that they are there. I think what we can learn from them is that there were many different communities who were very invested in this Ramayana tradition and took the time to really think through the different implications of the story and find resolution in their own way, in a way that made sense to them, right? So for, for people who subscribe to the Sita who's Maya, the Maya Sita, that is meaningful in its own way um, and helps them resolve certain tensions within the narrative that other versions can't resolve for them. So I, so I think it's wonderful. I mean, I think I don't think that there's um, one legitimate Ramayana and the rest are knockoffs or, you know, secondary versions. They're all, you know, the Ramayana tradition is so, it's so varied and it's so wonderful. I mean, there's just such a wealth of possibility um, throughout the entire tradition. Thank you.